All right, uh, we're about to get started. So first, I'd like to welcome everyone this evening. My name is Ali Jewell, and I'm the Science Outreach Coordinator uh, until the end of August. So thank you all very much for coming out to the lecture this evening. Uh, it's great to see you out here and ready to listen to Dr. Steve Evans and Dr. Marie Stussel on their annual Science Public Lecture. It's wonderful to see your open minds out here to learn. So starting us off this evening, we'll be looking at hydraulic fracturing as an industrial process. And um, this will be presented by Dr. Maurice Dussault. Uh, so he actually started out as a roughneck on the drilling rigs in Alberta, and that was over 50 years ago. But he's since then moved on to doing research and teaching geomechanics at Waterloo. Uh, he's moved, uh, so currently he's an advisor for four governments in Canada, Alberta, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland. And uh, you'll all be welcome to quiz him on that after the lecture. And so for the second part of this evening, we'll be learning about the hydro uh, hydraulic fracturing as a natural process. And this will be presented by Dr. Steve Evans. Uh, he works within the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. He's an expert in hazardous processes, natural disasters, and urban da damage systems. So he's spent plenty of time working plenty of very interesting places. Uh, including Ottawa for uh, the Geological Survey of Canada, but also um, in a number of interesting places such as Iran, Peru, the Philippines, and hopefully I'm saying this right, Tajikistan? Tajikistan. Tajikistan. So, uh, the capital of that is Ottawa. Um, sorry. <laughs> apparently the capital of Ottawa, but I feel like there might be uh, some false information there. <laughs> You're welcome to ask him about that after the lecture as well. Uh, but without any further ado, I would love to pass the presentation on to Maurice Dussel. Uh, he'll be able to get our evening started. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> and thank you for coming. Uh, tonight we'll uh, look, on, look, look upon hydraulic fracturing as a natural process, as an industrial process, comparing them a little bit. Uh, we start off by asking the question, what is a hydraulic fracture. Well, as an industrial process, it's a method of creating a more permeable subsurface. You're trying to create a condition where fluids can flow more easily in the deep sub subsurface. So you drill a well. Could we have the lights turned down a little bit, uh, please? I'm sorry, I don't know where the switch is. Is it here? Ah, there we go. There's too many buttons down here as usual. Okay, so if we can turn these off and leave ones on in the back. Is that okay? Yeah. Fairly romantic? All right. <laughs> so we drill a well, either a vertical well or a horizontal well, and horizontal wells are very common nowadays, of course. And uh, then we have to access the, uh, the formation, so we just created some little perforations there at the, at the bottom of the well bore. And this well bore might be two or three kilometers deep. And uh, then uh, we inject uh, high pressure fluid to fracture the rock. And you'll notice that I have this arrow here, sigma 3. That's the direction of the smallest stress in the earth. So the fracture tends to propagate at 90 degrees to the smallest stress in the earth when the injection pressure rises above that stress. So we have to bring the injection pressure above the smallest stress in the earth to create a hydraulic fracture. Whether it's an industrial process or a natural process, that is absolutely necessary to create a hydraulic fracture. So, hydraulic fracturing in nature. Here's one of my favorite hydraulic fractures. It's a dike right here. That's a hydraulic fracture going out from the fabulous ship rock in New Mexico. So without further uh, ado, since we've talked about natural fractures, my colleague Dr. Evans is going to take over and explain to you about natural fractures seen around the world in different situations. Steve. Thank you very much, uh, Maurice. Um, my job tonight is to give you some idea of what, what hydraulic fracturing is as a natural process. And I'm going to review 
uh, some quite recent work done mainly over the last five or ten years, taking advantage of these sorts of images, which is very advanced seismic reflection, which is which is uh, which is a which is a technique that we use to uh, remotely sense, if you like, the the structure of the subsurface in areas that we're interested in. And the scale here, by the way, you see the scale is about 100, 100 meters. So this would be about five, 600 meters, something like that. So just as an introduction to the images. <clears throat> and if we look at nature, and if we look at the range of geological processes that are acting in the natural environment, it actually turns out that hydraulic fracturing is one of the most important. It certainly is one of the most recently investigated in a quantitative, uh, in a quantitative fashion. And it's becoming realized that it's a very important process in many geological environments. I listed uh, five of them here, or maybe six of them here. Number one, it's an important process in plate tectonics, and we'll be talking in more detail in a moment about the role of hydraulic fracturing in subduction. That's when the crust goes into the subsurface and gets destroyed and recycled, and also spreading centers where the crust is pulling apart. Convergent and divergent plate tectonic boundaries. Very, very interesting recent paper on the role of hydraulic fracturing in subduction zones and also in the generation of mega thrust earthquakes. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Within sediment piles in sedimentary basins and very young offshore marine sediment sequences, this is where people are looking for oil. This is where much of the work that I'll be reporting tonight has been. Uh, has been gleaned from subsurface surveys of these geological environments and yielded spectacular images on deformation at depth due to hydraulic fracture or resulting in hydraulic fracture. If we look at the intrusion of magma and volcanism, volcanism, hydraulic fracturing is an important part of that geological environment, complicated by melting, but nevertheless, an important process. And hydraulic fracturing is also very important as a response to liquefaction in earthquakes. If you live in Richmond, D.C., you can look in the drainage, the drainage ditches near, uh, 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 near the airport, and you can see sand dice. You can see evidence of liquefaction in prehistoric earthquakes. We'll talk in some detail toward the end of this, uh, this, uh, this segment of the talk. It's also a glacial, a glacial process. One of the ways in which glaciers break down bedrock is through hydraulic fracturing. And it's also important, of course, because gold and other minerals occur in veins, and these veins form as a result of hydraulic fracturing. So when we look at this list in, 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 in sort of total, we can, uh, we can get a very good impression that it is a major geological process working in the subsurface and it occurs in this wide range of geological settings where fluid or gas is overpressured in a confined environment in the subsurface. The big, the big words in this particular sentence are overpressure and confined environment, where the fluid or gas is sealed initially, subject to overpressure, and that breaks the seal. And that breaking of the seal is the process of hydro, uh, sorry, of hydraulic fracture. So it is a complex process. I have discovered this in the last few days as I tried to put this talk together. I had to go back to basics. This individual here did all the work for us in the 1950s, and he's one of the geniuses of modern geology, modern geomechanics, modern petroleum geomechanics, as Dr. Dussault will testify. 
And this diagram here, I'm not going to go into great detail, this, this diagram here looks like a very simple diagram. It basically echoes what we said right at the beginning, that hydraulic fractures develop normal or at right angles to the direction of the least, of the least principal stress. If you see the arrow here and the fracture developing normal to the direction of uh, this, least, this least principal stress. That's easy to say, but it took about 15 or 20 years for guys to figure it out. And this individual here, King Hubbard, who is also famous for all sorts of other reasons, which Dr. Dussault will get into later on, it took him to figure out the math and the mechanics of this particular process. I'm not going to go through the list here, but some of the things he, he managed to put together in one unifying conceptual model was the fact that fluids in the subsurface reduce stresses to what we call effective stresses. Number one. This was discovered, by the way, by a Czech German engineer back in the 1920s called Karl von Tizagi, who was one of the fathers of human tanks. But it took this guy, King Hubbard, to basically sort out the effective stress so that the effect in hydraulic fracturing. He also managed to develop his theory recognizing that within the ground, stresses are, are unequal. Uh, they're not equal in every direction. And the direction of the least principal stress, that is the smallest stress of the stress field, is the key controlling factor in the geometry of hydraulic fracturing. He also, he also uh, managed to integrate the fracture conditions, which are quite complicated. He also talked about propagation, how these fractures spread through a rock mass, and how these are related to, to pre-existing natural, um, natural fractures, natural fractures, which exist before the hydraulic fracturing process is, uh, is developed. So, just to so point, or just to re-emphasize all of it, just to say that this is quite a complicated process. So we're glad that you come here to be entertained by this complexity tonight. So I'm going to talk about plate tectonics, and I'm going to go through this list quickly. Then I'm going to talk about the exotic topic of pockmarks and chimneys. I'm going to talk about some mud volcanoes, including some mud volcanoes from Azerbaijan. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about the response to liquefaction in earthquakes at the very small scale and the mega scale, with, with, a, with an example of liquefaction, which is basically simultaneous over about 20,000 square kilometers. And then, during my handover to Maurice, we'll jointly discuss the insights that looking at these natural processes gives us in terms of how industrial hydraulic fracturing works and the possible effects that it may have on the natural environment. So plate tectonics is, is probably one of the major scientific developments of the last century. And um, there are about, roughly speaking, about 52 plates on the Earth's surface, and you may be aware of this, that it's like an eggshell. The Earth's, the Earth's crust, the surface of the Earth, is like an eggshell broken up into, into what we call plates. And these, and, these, uh, and, these, uh, and these plates are moving. They're moving towards each other. They're moving apart. And they're sliding past each other in certain situations. And you can see the mother of all plates here, the Pacific plate, is this blurred or not? Yeah. Is it blurred? Yes. The right one focused on that. Good Lord. <laughs> I apologize profusely. That means all my discussion about King Hunter was blurred, which is not the intention. Anyway, okay. This is the Pacific plate, the mother of all plates. And uh, that's moving to the northwest. And as we see in this region here in the North Pacific, 
the West Pacific, the Southern Pacific, the area in the uh, New Zealand area here, the plate is moving towards the Eurasian plate that forms part, and when it meets the Eurasian plate, it's actually sliding down under the Eurasian plate. And we have these deep trenches in the West Pacific here, the Japan Trench and so on. And this is where the, some of the big earthquakes on the Earth's surface occur, the mega thrust earthquakes. And if we look at the distribution of earthquakes, we can see that they correlate very nicely with the, the, uh, the boundaries of these plates. And we can see from this map, whichever map we're going to look at here, um, we can see that the larger, the larger earthquakes are occurring in subduction zones in the Western Pacific. A typical subduction zone in the Western Pacific looks like this. This is actually the Sunda Trench off the coast of Indonesia. This is where the giant earthquake that generated the tsunami in 2004 took place, right in here. And we can see the red dots, or the reds, whatever they are, stars. These are the source, the source areas for these very large magnitude earthquakes. Okay, one the right is off the So here we see uh, some very shallow earthquakes with the scale here, but the scale is about 150 kilometers, and this would be between 20, 30, and 40 kilometers, something like that. We also see that as the Pacific plate is subducted, or the plate that I'm talking about, or the plate that's actually subducted, I shouldn't give it the name of the Pacific plate, because in the technically it's not right at this location. But as the subducting plate is moving downward, there is a scraping off of you know, material from the top of the subducting plate. And the scraping, uh, the scraping waste, if you like, forms what we call an accretive wedge, an accretion reef wedge, which is an important part of the mechanism of this subduction. And so what happens is the subduction is moving like this, stops, um, freezes, not freezes, but you know what I mean, blocks, and then ruptures, and that's when um, the mega thrust earthquake occurs. That's actually what the mechanism of a so-called mega thrust earthquake is. And so when we look at the Japan Trench, and we look at a geophysical cross, cross section, a, a, a geophysical profile of the subduction zone in the vicinity of the, of the Japan Trench, and we look at the epicenter and the focus of the 2011 megahertz earthquake that caused the Japanese tsunami, magnitude 9, by the way, very high magnitude, it's been established that it involved the rupture in the same sort of zone as I was just talking about, in the Sunda Trench, meaning at the boundary between the accretion and the wedge zone here and the subducting plate. And it's very interesting <coughs> that, and I'm going to try to speed up a bit because I might be here all night and that will be very dangerous with Maurice in the room. He said, I don't get off the stage soon, he's going to have words to say in my ear. And so, Look at the Japan Trench ship. This is the Japan Trench. The plate is moving to the west, subducting underneath uh, this, this particular plate here. And it's in this particular process that the, that the mega thrust mechanism generated the 2011 earthquake. Recent work uh, has been carried out by a number of workers on how hydraulic fracturing is contributing to this mechanism. And the way in which hydraulic fracturing is contributing to mega first earthquake mechanism is by, there are lots of fluids deep in the accretion reef wedge, both from deep sources as well as uh, water from within sediments which are, which are involved in the subduction. And these, these fluids become, uh, become super-pressurized. 
break through the accretion wedge and break out to the surface here, where we can observe that they that the discharge points uh, create seepage zones and mud mounds on the surface of the accretion wedge. How does the supervised magnetic thrust mechanism? Well, when the fault, when the subduction fault is under some sort of overpressure, the friction of that surface is reduced and sliding is much more rapid, much easier if you like. When drainage takes place, the friction is increased and we enter a stick phase of this stick sort of alternation. And there's actually a term that tectonic uh, hydrogeologists, I guess you call them, there's a, there's a term that they've come up with, and that is a fault valve for releasing this, this overpressure in the subduction zone. So we get this cyclic uh, development of pressure, um, hydraulic fracturing, reduction in the pressure, and that is correlated with slip, stick, slip, stick, sort of, sort of alternating back and forth. <clears throat> so it's been established that the hydraulic fracturing and the drainage of this overpressure leads to a locking of the plates and therefore creating mega thrust potential. And for those who are interested, this is the coast that was affected by the tsunami. And you may have seen the news, I saw the news recently, the Great Wall of Japan is now being constructed to protect something like 450 kilometers of Japanese coastline. You can always rely on Andy Warhol to bring you back to reality. And this is his rendition of a volcanic eruption. And volcanoes, volcanic eruptions, lead from, uh, lead from hydraulic fracturing in a rather spectacular way. And I'm going to talk about the spreading centers in plate tectonics, the mid-ocean ridges and continental rifts, where the plates are pulling apart. And, and in this geological or uh, uh, tectonic environment, we get the upwelling of magma into this extensional environment. And we have volcanic eruption basically with a magma leaking through or pushing through this sort of carapace of solidified lava. And you can see the sort of fractured geometry that we're talking about in this image here. Um, the magma is forcing its way through and basically forcing these fragments that you see apart. A sort of hydraulic fracturing, if you like. And here is, a, here is an image from the Icelandic region showing this sort of tabular, uh, sheep-like um, sort of intrusion of magma along these linear fractures. And if we go to Iceland, we can look at uh, the region here, for example, of Iceland. You can see this gigantic amount of lava that's been erupted over the last millions of years, and a typical dike swarm, a typical swarm of this sort of intrusive, uh, uh, intrusive body, the dikes, can be easily seen in the landscape. Again, reflecting the, the pushing up of, of magma into these vertical fractures in this extension environment. And of course, uh, and I bet you cannot say this, the name of this volcano which occurred, uh, sorry, which erupted in April 2010. It's Ayapaya Yoko. There we are. And it, uh, it erupted in April 2010 with some really spectacular photographs in the newspaper and on the internet. And of course, the big thing about this particular volcanic eruption, there was a cloud of volcanic ash that spread from Iceland here, southern Iceland, all through the airspace of Europe toward the coast of Norway, Northern Scotland, and so on. And we get a tank hydraulic fracturing for this, um, for this uh, situation. And uh, I have to show you this. Um, 
because this is the uh, this is the airspace of Europe on one of the worst days of this volcanic ash uh, contamination or airborne cloud, preventing the normal density of traffic to fly in the northern Western European region. You can see a normal density of here, here somewhere, like in the United States or in the Spanish region here. So it had considerable impact on air travel for, uh, for up to about two and a half weeks. That's the plate tectonic environment. The second thing I'm going to be talking about is pockmarks, sorry, pockmarks and chimneys. Horrible, you know, horrible phraseology, but there we are. Geologists sometimes make interesting choices, weird choices. And this is a typical sort of mobile sedimentary environment. It's uh, from a paper by Cruz et al. in 2010, which shows the occurrence of overpressured fluids in the yellow beds that you see here. Don't worry about the detailed structure. And the fluid in uh, these aquifers that you see at some depth becomes under pressure uh, for various reasons, including the compression of this particular environment because of all the, the movement that's going on. This leads to the migration of these fluids through the subsurface right to the surface where they are seen manifested by, well, first of all, you can see them in the subsurface through seismic profiling or seismic imaging these uh, so-called chimneys, and then you can see the pockmarks actually on the surface. We'll also talk about the mud volcanoes in a moment as well. So basically, we've got a very, very high pressure fluids in these aquifers, basically under high volume fracturing conditions, uh, moving up towards the surface. And when we look at uh, the uh, morphology or the geometry of these chimneys, they're actually quite spectacular. Uh, this one I showed you right at the beginning, and we can see another example here from the coast of, just offshore the coast of Namibia in southern Africa. We can see this very nice chimney structure going right to the top. And these have become quite common in um, C4 environments, in surveys of C4 environments, the occurrence of the chimneys has been quite common, has become quite common. And of course, where they hit the surface, we can see small craters. And when we look at when we look at imagery on the sea floor, we see in some areas many hundreds of these pop marks uh, delimiting or de demarcating where the chimney hits or intersects the floor of the sea, the southern surface. And it gets quite exotic uh, when we look at it, without uh, going into details here, you can see hydraulic fracturing taking place in the cover, the sedimentary cover in these situations, uh, basically rooting gas from subsurface, uh, uh, some, you know, subsurface reservoirs into the submarine environment. And when we look at a map of these shock marks, this is the sort of density that is typical of, for example, the coast of Norway. And this is a cartoon which, uh, which outlines the formation of these chimneys in this environment. Here we have the overpressure, here we have the development of the fracture, here we have the movement of fluids to the surface, causing this pop mark, and uh, the residual pop mark then just basically fills in the sediment. And without going into details on this, it is actually possible with the knowledge that we have of hydraulic fracturing and thresholds of uh, thresholds of uh, behavior, both of upward movement and lateral movement, we can actually reconstruct in quite a complicated fashion um, the sort of uh, the, uh, the fracture history of a particular stratigraphic a column such as this. One thing I should add 
And that is the depth here. We'll come back to depth in a moment. But this goes down to about 2,000 meters, 2 kilometers if you prefer. And these are the sorts of depths that we talked about when we talked about hydraulic fracturing, between natural hydraulic fracturing, that is, between 1,500 and something like 3,000 meters in general. Mud volcanoes is something I knew nothing about before Thursday afternoon. And I thought, well, you know, I, I knew about them in general. But mud volcanoes are absolutely fascinating. And in fact, the reason I just talked about, uh, about developing, developing a proposal to do some research into mud volcanoes. They're actually widespread for the world. You see a map here, the little circles that you see all over the place mainly in compressive tectonic regimes, quite widespread throughout the world. What are they? Well, they form when, <coughs> when, um, when overpressured fluids reach or move through the subsurface and on the way transport mud, silt, sand from various uh, from the various strata that they actually pass through. When they reach the surface, it's like an eruption, not of lava, but of wet, gooey mud. And they all result from a source within overpressured strata at depth, generating the energy to cut through the cover rocks. If you look at Google Earth, you can go to a place called Baku in Azerbaijan, just to the southwest of Baku, and uh, you can actually see some quite spectacular landforms in this region, which are mud volcanoes. They look like lava volcanoes, conventional lava volcanoes, but they're not. They're mud volcanoes. And the material we see flowing down the side of the uh, volcano in this, in this situation is basically chemically supercharged water mixed in with fine sands, silts, and clay. Probably fine sands and silt. And just recently, um, there was a case of a mud volcano in Indonesia. I'm going to speed up a bit. And uh, in fact, Maurice was just telling me that he, that he worked on this particular event. So I feel a bit uh, strange talking about it. But this mud volcano basically uh, started forming in May 2006. And in the nine years since that mud volcano first erupted, something like 100 million cubic meters of mud has formed, forming this spectacular mud volcano with the uh, landform that you see. And basically, I'm not going to get into detail here, but again, the source of the overpressure fluids with the blue strata that you see here. And because of a drilling, a drilling exercise, um, there was hydraulic fracturing, which reached the surface, bringing water from something like three or three and a half kilometers below the surface. These are deep sources of pressured water, or, or overpressured fluids, I should say. When we, when we uh, look at the after effects of earthquakes, we can map out areas which are subject to what we call liquid patch. And as I said, if you live in Richmond, D.C., go down the road, you can look in the and you can actually see the, the evidence of past of the fraction. You can, the sort of interpretation and the analysis of prehistoric liquid fraction events and the dating of these events is a major tool in paleo seismology. So, what does liquefaction mean? Well, liquefaction involves the, the densification, the sudden densification of very, um, very, uh, very open work type sediments. That is, sediments with, uh, with a low density, with a high percentage of voids. And the shaking of the earthquake basically leads to a structural collapse and a reduction in the voids from this point to this point 
jacks up pull pressure, leads to a transient sort of overpressure in this particular strata, which can exceed lithostatic values. And it's really quite interesting, I'm not going to get into this in some detail because the time is running short, but in this particular event, USGS, the United States Geological Survey, actually had consolidants, that is to measure forward pressure, in the ground at the time of an earthquake, and were actually, were actually able to measure the liquefaction. And it happened in something like 19 seconds. And so what happens? Liquefaction takes place in like this sort of sand layer that we're talking about in here. This is then the source of the overpressured fluids then break through anything above it, the low, the low permeability uh, seal, if you like, and it breaks through to the surface where it forms another volcano-like feature, this time called a sand volcano. Sometimes the water keeps on going into the atmosphere, maybe three or four or five meters, something like that, and uh, these are called sand flows. You may have seen them during an earthquake. Um, and the resulting deep central feature is called a sand volcano. Very, very common in the wake of major earthquakes. And we can, we can analyze, we can, uh, we can look at this, and in fact, we can, uh, we can date, especially at the prehistoric, from organic remains within the sediments, we can date um, the occurrence of paleo earthquakes. And it's all due to the fact that this, that this impermeable sort of seal, if you like, is fractured by hydraulic fracturing, which allows the sand to move, back to move up to the surface. And these have been documented in Calabria back in the 1700s. You can see the crater here. This is when, um, this is uh, this is where um, the fluid was just kept on going and shot up and left a big crater in the wake of that particular sand blow. And when we look at, uh, when we look at um, the, uh, the, uh, sorry, the geological record, when we look at the geological record, we can actually sort out the sequence of events. For example, uh, this, this sand, uh, this sand like here formed, uh, formed after this sand sill here. And so we can, by interpreting these sorts of geological sections, we can put together a chronology of paleo earthquakes. Same thing here. And uh, these date then liquefiable or, or liquefaction events or liquefaction episodes, which of course we correlate with seismic shape. And from the radiocarbon dates of something like this, we can put together a paleo earthquake record. So this is quite shallow hydraulic fracturing, not at the super fantastic high sort of overpressures that we were talking about when we have to bring fluids from three kilometers in depth. This is probably near to three meters, but nevertheless the same sort of process being involved. And this has been documented on a gigantic scale in the middle Jurassic sandstones of southeastern Utah. And there is a geological, or two geological units that show extensive evidence of liquefaction. They were uh, shallow continental deposits at the time when this liquefaction took place. They were not three, three or four kilometers in the crust or in the subsurface. And they involved, or the events, the events involved, the liquefaction dune sands with, uh, with a sedimentary cover. And the area that was affected by liquefaction in, in this particular case is something like 32, uh, sorry, 32 or 20, 22,000 square kilometers. Huge liquefaction from there. So I hope I've given you some sort of insight into natural hydraulic fracture. And it's a very important natural process, a very important geological process. It involves sources of overpressured water in the deep subsurface and in the shallow subsurface. 
It's a, a very important and developing field of research in the earth sciences at the moment. And uh, names uh, keep coming up. This guy Davis, for example, uh, is quite well known in the field. And it's an important slide to finish on, at least as far as I'm concerned, anyway. And I'm going to finish in a minute and hand it to, to Maurice. And what Maurice is going to do now is to comment on these two graphs, which I've lined up, by the way, at two kilometers. You can see the line there, the horizontal line, uh, from a paper by Davis, which basically compares on the left the height range or the elevational range or the depth range of natural hydraulic fracturing comparing it to industrial hydraulic fracturing. And at that moment, I'm going to pass off my microphone to Maurice. The laser pointer. Thank you. <coughs> I don't need the microphone. Oh, there we are. That's uh, <laughs> when I was seven years old, my cousins called me professor. So it was, it was fate. Anyway, uh, I just want to comment here that on the left-hand side, we see the hydraulic fractures caused by nature propagating up to the surface from considerable depth. On the right-hand side, we see uh, the uh, cartoon by uh, Dr. Davies showing fracture propagation that is very limited in height. I assure you that this height of about 700 meters above the reservoir that is being fractured, to the best of my knowledge, that has never happened. 200 meters, 250 meters, we have evidence from the study of thousands of hydraulic fracturing episodes that that kind of height above the formation can be achieved. 700 meters? No. So when someone sees a diagram like this and says, well, fractures can come to the surface, the answer is, in nature, yes. The volumes are vast. They're huge. A volcanic eruption of lava, the volume of gas that erupts to create a mud volcano, these are millions and millions of cubic meters. Hydraulic fracturing in industry for a particular fracture operation might be 1,000 cubic meters, maybe 3,000 cubic meters. There is no mechanical possibility for that fracture to rise up to the surface. It just doesn't have the volume. It just doesn't have the volume. So don't be scared by images that purport to demonstrate or to imply that industrial hydraulic fractures at a depth of two to three kilometers will pop out at the surface. That is false. We have no known occurrence of that having happened to date. We have a lot of data that shows that it is much, much smaller of a, of a rise than, uh, than from, the, from depth. Okay, so let me go to my slides here and uh, take you through three examples of hydraulic fracturing as an industrial process. Enhanced geothermal systems, which is a future technology in Canada, Deep solid waste disposal, which is a new technology being used in Canada and developed in Canada. And natural gas development with hydraulic fracturing, which is a technology that is well understood over the last few decades and has been developed in Canada and the United States. So an enhanced germal, germal, an enhanced geothermal system Basically, we have hot rocks or hot fluids, and we wish to exploit the thermal energy in those fluids. We have to access these fluids through boreholes. So here on your left is a cold water injection borehole, and on your right is another borehole bringing the hot fluids to the surface to a processing facility 
from which we can extract the energy. And the energy can be extracted uh, either as uh, power, electricity, or heat. So, an enhanced geothermal system is essentially deep, hot rock. It may be wet, it may be dry. Probably at least 100 degrees Celsius. Although, with new technologies, that limit might be reduced somewhat. We need to get the heat from the rock, we have to get it to the surface, we have to find a way to use the energy, and fortunately or unfortunately in Canada, there is a great need for heat energy in the winter, less so in California. So that means that we actually have an advantage in that we can use the heat, whereas in California, they just want the electricity. And by the way, the largest geothermal uh, facility in uh, North America is in the geysers near Santa Rosa, California, which I also have worked on. So this is a geothermal energy potential map of Canada. And red is hot, blue is cold, and yes, Ontario down here is, uh, is, is cold. <laughs> so uh, you don't have the potential that you do in the left coast here, okay? So here are these hot spots, and these are places where the geothermal gradient is very high. And there's potentially a lot of energy down there if you can get to it and exploit it. The white areas are simply areas for which no measurements have been made of the, uh, of the uh, energy at, at that depth, but we would generally expect the entire Canadian Shield to be uh, low, lower quality than the West Coast. The Western Canada Sedimentary Basin, that's that big colorful streak on the left, and interestingly enough, the Maritimes look a little bit better than Ontario. Power, earthful, and if you want more information on geothermal, go to CANGEA, the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association website, and you'll be able to read all kinds of cool stuff. Well, warm stuff, anyway. Or you get my, something like that. So, how do we develop the EGS, the Enhanced Geothermal System? Well, we have to, essentially, hydraulically fracture. So these wells that are drilled, and it may be a horizontal well going through the middle of this, of this yellow ellipse here. The well is fractured along its length to increase the surface area so that you can contact more of a volume of rock with one well. And so you have a high surface area so you can extract the heat more rapidly. That is necessary in order for us to proceed to make enhanced geothermal systems economic. We have to do hydraulic fracturing to generate the permeability, the flow capacity for these wells. We also have to drill boreholes cheaply, and that is a challenge. Uh, we have to do the massive hydraulic fracturing, inject cool fluids cool, uh, to uh, withdraw the hot fluids, and of course, everything has to be done correctly, uh, but there are always effects and consequences from any industrial activity. One of the consequences of withdrawing geothermal heat is that we are going to generate micro-earthquakes or small earthquakes, for sure. In the geysers area of California near Santa Rosa, it is, the rock is crackling and snappling all the time, just like Rice Krispies when you pour milk on. So things have to be done correctly. We have to uh, understand the mechanical response of this uh, fractured region that we have fractured. And another thing that we need is special low temperature turbines that can use, uh, we call this the binary approach, where the hot fluids are exchanging their heat with another fluid that might be something like a refrigerant. Only instead of cooling, we're actually heating and taking power out the other side. So this refrigerant is actually cool here because we're extracting power and it's warmed up by these fluids and as it passes through the turbine it expands and cools just like a fridge so we can use a much smaller temperature difference so Ontario isn't completely dead geothermally there are some 
potential uh, resources here, but trust me, BC is well endowed and will exploit geothermal energy far ahead of us. So enhanced geothermal systems have the potential to be largely renewable because of slow heat flow from the earth, uh, relatively environmentally benign, but every industrial process has issues, uh, and reasonably effective. Uh, in other words, not too costly compared to the alternatives. And whenever you talk about energy, you must compare to the alternatives. We have to do hydraulic fracturing to develop that EGS resource. All right, the next industrial process where hydraulic fracturing is used is in deep solid waste disposal. The picture here, and we call these dirty pictures, is of uh, typical sludge that forms when you're producing heavy oil in Saskatchewan. This picture is in Saskatchewan. And what you see here is perfectly natural substances. This is not toxic waste. Uh, it's uh, water, formation water, uh, minerals, some sand and clay and uh, fine grain silica minerals, uh, and about 30% heavy oil, and it's all been swished up in a pump to create a very stable emulsion. This is extremely expensive to get rid of. So, technologies to get rid of this kind of waste have to be explored. These heavy oil wells in Alberta and Saskatchewan, some of them, may also produce a lot of sand. This is actually sand from about 600 meters deep that has been produced as, along with the heavy oil, maybe 1% sand by volume uh, in the heavy oil. And the sand is separated and then brought to this site uh, where it eventually has to leave to be disposed of by one or another method. And one method is Reinjection of these wastes down into the formations that they came from, putting, putting these oils and waters and, and minerals back where they came from, rather than leaving them at the surface. So here's how it's done. Waste solids are mixed up with waste water through a hopper, screener, and a mixed tank system. So the water and the solids are brought together in the mixed tank and mixed very thoroughly, and then this heavy-duty pump down here is injecting the, this slurry, that's why we call it a slurry uh, disposal method, or slurry fracture injection, injecting it into a deep well. Now, the only way that you can inject a slurry with solid material into it, uh, in it rather, at depth is continuous hydraulic fracturing. You've got to actually fracture to do it. You can't inject it into uh, these sandstones five, six, seven hundred meters deep without continuous hydraulic fracturing. So here's a system right here, uh, getting rid of uh, about five, six thousand cubic meters of, uh, of superficial soil that has been contaminated in the historical past by, uh, by oil. And here is the hopper, and here is the uh, screens that are taking out the big fragments and dead rabbits and boots, and you would be amazed what you find in waste. You know, somebody gets rid of a hard hat, you know, what do they do? Throw it in the waste pile. You can't pump a hard hat down a borehole, okay? So, so here's the mixer, mix tank, here's the big heavy-duty pump, and here's the injection well right there, right there. And that's the outhouse, and that's Los Angeles. This is happening within the boundaries of Los Angeles. It's actually called the Coyote Hills uh, Oil Reservoir, uh, which is long since dead. And in order to sell the land at a very high value, the oil company had to spend a lot of money to clean up all residual oil contamination. And one of the techniques they used was slurry injection. Moving on to uh, the other side of the world, uh, and uh, Dr. Evans talked about the subduction zone right here. There's a subduction zone right here. And I've worked on mud volcanoes offshore of, uh, of uh, Kalimantan, which used to be called Borneo, uh, off in this uh, Straits of Malacca as well. Uh, but I'd, I've done some work here in uh, Duri, which is one of the biggest heavy oil operations in, uh, in that part of the world, maybe the biggest. And here is something that they built about 12 years ago. It's a slurry 
waste injection system that's injecting all of the oil field waste, all of the oil field waste, like the materials I showed you, down about five, six hundred meters deep into a porous formation. So here is the pumping unit and here is the, uh, the swimming pool, as they call it, where the waste are dumped into. And this is the, uh, the office and the water tanks. I won't read all the words. We'll just move on. Here are some dump trucks delivering crap, not to make a too fine a point about it. And I'll show you where this is coming from, actually, uh, into this swimming pool, okay? So these are trucks dumping, dumping stuff. That's where they came from. These were ponds that were left behind from, uh, from uh, oil development for many years, and there was a lot of concern by the company that these ponds were not environmentally uh, suitable, the slow seepage of, uh, of oil into the aquifer. So the oily sludge and sand that you saw in those trucks came from those ponds. These ponds were cleaned up in the early part of the last decade, like 2003 to 2005. That's what it looks like in 2007. Now the jungle is 10 meters high and growing. It's pointed to by the Indonesian government as excellent environmental protection. The whole oil field now, Duri, the heavy oil field, is approaching a zero emissions, that solids and liquids emissions uh, condition because of that waste facility that you saw. In Louisiana, I'll show you a case uh, in Louisiana. This is a, uh, again, oil field waste. And you see the expense that they have gone to to try to isolate the wastes. This is a sheet pile wall. Every one of these things has been pounded down with a ceiling joint between them to try to protect uh, the, uh, the uh, bayou here from, the see from seepage of uh, oily wastes into the bayou. So here's your injection facilities, and here's some uh, backhoes that are, actually dredging, that are actually taking up this contaminated material and getting it to that injection facility where, it's being, where it was injected down about 800 meters, uh, far below any depth where it could interact with the environment. So this is before. This is what it looks like now. It's nice bayous, and you can see some some birds sitting there uh, looking for uh, water snakes and frogs. And the technology in the last few years has, is being trialed to get rid of your waste, municipal biosolids, which is a very expensive waste to get rid of. So the concept is that biosolid waste that is preliminary treated is br brought to a facility, injected through a deep well bore, into a disposal horizon. And in the southern part of the city of Los Angeles, this is happening at a depth of 1.35 kilometers, so 1,350 meters deep, into an old abandoned oil field that was abandoned uh, a generation ago. One side benefit is that the organic matter from your waste, if it is buried in this environment, can actually generate methane. And this concept here is methane recovery at some time in the future. It takes about three years at this depth, at those temperatures, for your wastes to actually generate about 10 or 15 percent of their mass as methane, which in principle is recoverable. So this is the methane recovery well. And that's the concept, and this is the site. Okay? So there's the injection well, and uh, the pumping system is here, and uh, it's operating as a pilot project. And if it all turns out nice, it may be adopted as a preferred technology because it's far more secure than dumping treated biosolids on farmland. So slurry fracture injection. Hydraulic fracturing is used to return oil field wastes to where they came from, deep in the ground. 
The technology of slurry fracture injection has been extended to human biosolids wastes, which is an expensive waste stream. And the deep placement using hydraulic fracturing assures very low environmental and health risks compared to the alternatives. Natural gas. This is a pre-2015 coal-fired power in Ontario. What replaced coal in Ontario? Natural gas. This is the Halton Hills natural gas power plant just uh, east of Milton. We have 19 or 20 of them in, in Ontario. I don't know if the 20th has been finished yet, but 19 last I heard. They provide about 19% of Ontario's electrical power. And where does this gas come from? Would anyone like to speculate? Pennsylvania. Pardon? Pennsylvania. Thank you. Absolutely right. Pennsylvania. Why is Ontario buying gas from Pennsylvania instead of from Alberta and BC? It's cheaper. Hey, come on. This is economics 101. It's cheap. So that's what's happening, is that we are now importing natural gas into Ontario more and more and more from Pennsylvania because you cannot ship it from Alberta and BC at a price that is competitive. That's why the Trans-Canada Pipeline across Canada is operating now at somewhat lower, somewhat less than 50% of its capacity. And it's dropping. Okay? No such thing as saying, well, gee, we're going to buy Canadian gas. No, no, no. It's, we're going to buy cheap gas. That's, that's, the, that's the process that goes on. How is that gas in Pennsylvania produced? By fracking. Right. So the next time you fill your propane tank or turn on your natural gas furnace in the middle of winter, it's fracking. So the Globe and Mail on Saturday, two days ago, Eric uh, Reguli uh, wrote an article, uh, an editorial. I uh, suggest you read it. Uh, the title is, Sadly, the Time Isn't Right for Clean Energy. And there's a number of reasons for that. I, I can't go into them. But essentially, uh, this is the last paragraph, the last sentence of the last paragraph of his uh, article. Uh, if carbon is to be left in the ground for the sake of the planet, vast amounts of renewable energy have to be installed quickly. The cost will be truly horrendous, may be unaffordable to our economy at the present, uh, under present conditions. So, how do we get there? Well, natural gas can be a bridge to a renewable energy future, and I'll explain why. First of all, you don't want to use coal in general, at least not with current technology. Maybe technologies are going to improve uh, where we do carbon capture from coal combustion. And if you think coal is bad, wood is worse. Okay? Not only is it uh, environmentally uh, an, an issue for the harvesting of the wood, uh, it's also very rich in particulates, that's what is called smoke, and it's particulates that cause health problems. Oil and ethanol from corn also has been shown to be environmentally very... In fact, there is good reason to believe that we're not saving any energy at all by producing ethanol from plants. And it is competing for food. What about nuclear? What about hydro? All of these have issues. Ontario is deficient in hydro. Uh, pretty well maxed out right now, the hydroelectric power potential. What about uh, natural gas compared to wind and, and solar? Well, one thing about natural gas is that with the amount that's been discovered in Canada and the United States recently, it's going to remain a, a low-cost source of power for probably decades. And that's going to give us time to, uh, to uh, develop renewable energy technologies. And one of these that's very important that we just don't have is energy storage. You may not know it, but the government of Ontario, the Liberal government of Ontario some years ago, mandated that the Ontario Power Generator, OPG, must accept 100% of solar and wind-produced power. 
So when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining on a July day when the temperature is 20 and nobody needs air conditioning or electrical heat, Ontario is giving away, giving away large amounts of electricity to Michigan. The value of that last year probably was on the order of $1.3 billion. Uh, Michigan is happy to accept it. Energy policy is a complex issue. So here we are in Ontario, uh, last uh, two years ago, but it hasn't changed much. Coal now has disappeared, okay, so that's, that's gone pretty well. So here's hydro, about uh, 23%. Natural gas, about 11%, but it's up to about 18 or 17% uh, or 16% soon. Uh, nuclear, 59%, and wind and uh, other, uh, about, uh, about 4%. Now, a colleague of mine who is extremely environmentally sensitive has said to me that uh, we have to stop using fossil fuels. Okay, we'll get rid of that uh, 10 or 15% here. And hydroelectric... Uh, power causes severe ecosystem disruption. Species uh, can be severely harmed. Uh, and so if we get rid of that 23%, uh, then we have nuclear. And of course, my colleague does not like the whole issue of nuclear waste, so he feels that nuclear should be phased out. Okay. Now, if we're going to go to a more electrical society where electrical cars are used, for example, instead of burning oil and uh, and, and diesel fuel, or gasoline and diesel fuel, we're going to have to generate a heck of a lot more electrical power than we do now. Where is it going to come from? That's a policy issue. I can't answer that question. The NEB, the National Energy Board, tries to make predictions. So this is the situation a few years ago in 2010 on the left, and on your right, the, their prediction, the National Energy Board prediction in 2035. Now this was made before the big collapse in natural gas prices uh, because of the hydraulic fracturing and the shale gas development in Pennsylvania. So uh, uh, probably the impact of gas is massively underestimated. So here is coal. I do remind you that Alberta gets 43% of its power from coal. Nova Scotia, where they banned natural gas development last September, gets 56% of its electrical power from coal, and they banned natural gas development. Okay? It's interesting. So here's the prediction for 20 years from now. Coal will still be used at a much, much smaller le level, instead of 14% down to 6%, and the yellow wedge there is carbon, uh, coal that is from which the carbon dioxide is recovered and injected deep in the ground, what we call sequestration. That's nuclear. Nuclear is not suggested for growth by the NEB. Hydro is not suggested for growth by the NEB. There's growth in renewables and growth in gas. That's the NEB's projections for the next 30 years or 20 years. I think that they are actually wrong because gas has become so cheap compared to what it was only five years ago that, I th that gas, uh, I think, is not going to be 15% in 2035. It's probably going to be closer to 20%. Premier Prentice in Alberta has said that there will be no new coal fired uh, power trains built. Any new power requirements in Alberta will come from other sources. That means largely natural gas. Saskatchewan, a lot of coal-fired power. All right, natural gas and hydraulic fracturing. We now have, courtesy of shale gas, a real revolution, uh, we have massive quantities of natural gas, and in Canada we have well over 500 years of natural gas available to us at current levels of consumption. Uh, probably much, much more than that. Because every time we look carefully, we find more 
in these per formations that have to be hydraulically fractured. It's relatively, uh, compared to other industries like fishing and farming, the natural gas industry is very safe. If you want to put your life and limb at risk, become a farmer, become a fisher, become a forestry worker. If you go into Canada Health, you'll find that those are far, far more dangerous industries than the uh, natural gas industry. The amount of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of power is about half that of coal. But more important, you eliminate the particulates, you eliminate the mercury that goes into the atmosphere, you eliminate the, the uh, nitrous, uh, nitrogen oxides and the sulfur oxides, you eliminate tailings ponds, you eliminate all of those other environmental issues uh, if you replace coal with natural gas. So the bridge towards a lower carbon dioxide environment in the world from where we are today is to replace coal as much as we can with natural gas, replace oil as much as we can with natural gas, create more electricity so we can move gradually towards more electrical vehicles, and that will reduce the carbon footprint, our carbon footprint, substantially. In the United States, coal consumption has dropped tremendously in the last 10 years in favor of natural gas, and the United States is the only large country that has met the Kyoto Protocol obligations that it never did agree to. <laughs> ironic, isn't it? It's really ironic. Well, natural gas requires hydraulic fracturing, pipelines, and places to store it for the winter. Here in Ontario, we have about 25 small little reefs around Chatham, where we actually store natural gas during the summer and use more of it in the winter. So now I have some dirty pictures to show you. Uh, this is Tian, Tiananmen uh, in Beijing uh, on a good day. Uh, I saw uh, when I was there last, uh, last year, uh, I, I did see a blue sky. It was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, and it, no, no, it was really a wonderful northwest wind and, and rain and it cleaned up the sky. But normally it's like this uh, in Beijing. When you land in Beijing, your mouth tastes of sulfur. I'm sure some of you have experienced that. And here's the solar panel manufacturing center of the world. Okay? I want to point out the uh, cooling towers and the smokestack here. And again, uh, blue sky is a rarity. It's Baoding. And again, it's somewhat ironic that it's the solar panel producing center of the world. Romania. And if we go and look at the reasons for premature death, Particulate matter in the atmosphere, pollution from burning oil, diesel fuel, bunker fuel, coal, is the number one cause of premature death in the world. It's actually an epidemic in China and India. Here in Canada, very low population density, not a problem. In Harbin, a year and a half ago, they actually had to shut down public transit for a day because the buses couldn't see where they were going. So how do we get, how do we get rid of this? Well, this is coal-fired and oil, oil and cars, uh, gasoline. How do we get rid of that? Well, the easiest way technologically and financially, economically, uh, and technically is to replace these other fuels with coal. Uh, sorry, <laughs> with, with natural gas. Ooh. Slip of the tongue there, Freudian slip, sorry. Replace it with natural gas, okay? Because after all, I ask you the question, do Chinese people deserve a better quality of life? This is not just an economic issue, this is a humanitarian issue. If we were serious about quality of life, we would, we would be working as hard as we can to help India, China, and some other large centers like Jakarta and Bangkok uh, clean up their air through the use of more benign uh, sources of electricity. And in the short term, since we can't develop renewables fast enough, that means natural gas. So that's why natural gas can serve as a bridge. And natural gas is not new. Uh, New York 
the first commercial gas well in North America that was used for commercial purposes to actually light street lamps was gas from a hand dug well in Fredonia, New York, and it was shale gas. It came from the Marcellus and Utica shales, which underlie the state of New York. Okay? Well, that was your great, 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 great grandfather's technology, a hand dug well. Things are a little bit different now. So here's a fracking operation with 25 frack trucks all lined up, fracking this well right here. Okay? And down below, this well is a long horizontal well, and they're fracking it at a number of stages. Each stage is maybe 1,000 cubic meters, which they'll frack, and then they'll leave, they'll leave that, the pressure decay and move on to the next stage. So it might take three days to frack this well. And the pressures are very, very high. We have to create those overpressures uh, that uh, Dr. Evans talked about. Only now we're creating them industrially. And uh, by the way, the pressures are so high that when you're fracking, nobody is allowed in this area at all. All of these trucks are remote control operated. Okay, that's one of the reasons why it's fairly safe. Here is uh, from the uh, shale gas report of the Canadian Council of Academies uh, that was published in May of last year. Uh, this is a multi-well pad in uh, British Columbia. Uh, this is uh, maybe uh, 16 wells here. Do you know how much that costs, that pad, to drill and hydraulically fracture? $220 million. This is very big industrial activity, okay? Very big. So the uh, concentration of the well density is unprecedented, so we have to be environmentally uh, aware that issues can, uh, can develop and do it carefully. So natural gas development is a large industrial activity, and it must be regulated and done safely. <coughs> Hydraulic fracturing, if you look at the numbers, is not an inherently dangerous technology, not even on the environment, compared to things like farming. There are thousands of incidents each year of contamination of uh, wells and contamination of aquifers from the spilling of farm chemicals, uh, those incidents are much fewer than they used to be, but they still happen. Uh, hydraulic fracturing is, uh, is generally safer than that. Uh, and it's gradually being made safer by regulations and enforcement of the regulations. I believe that hydraulic fracturing has large net benefits in developing natural gas to replace coal, wood, fuel oil, and ethanol. It has large net benefits compared to the alternatives. Because when we, when we discuss our energy future, we must weigh the impact of all the alternatives. The ones that we use, the ones that we want to phase out, the ones that we want to bring in. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for your interest. Dr. Evans is going to make a couple of uh, close, closing comments. And then, uh, if any of you are, are interested in asking any questions of us, we'll try to answer the questions. And, we're already at 8.20, so those of you that uh, want to go home and have a glass of Merlot, uh, I encourage you to uh, leave when you feel comfortable leaving. Thank you. That's your speaker. Well, I didn't have a lot of commentary really following that. Um, but I was interested in Reese. Um, when we compare natural fracking, if you like, to industrial fracking, and you show that amazing picture of like, I don't know how many trucks, but uh, 15, 20 trucks, maybe more. What sort, of, what sort of pressures are they producing compared to some of the highest pressures that you've encountered in natural fracking? Well, down below, uh, two and a half kilometers deep, uh, that, that well that you saw that was being fracked is about two kilometers deep. At the point that they're fracking down below, uh, the, if you want a number, the pressures are, are about uh, uh, 60 megapascals uh, pressure at the well face. Now, that's enough to open up the rock and create fractures, and they pump in fluids to try to make very complex, complex fractures to open up a whole bunch of the natural fractures. 
But interestingly enough, these rocks are actually all naturally fractured already. So what we're really doing is opening up the natural fractures so they are conduits for the gas. Same thing in enhanced geothermal. We're opening up the natural fractures, not really creating a whole bunch of new ones. So very high pressures, a big heavy-duty industrial process, and that's why safety is, uh, is really important. But these kind of pressures are similar to the pressures that are generated in natural fracturing from, from uh, deep processes, like three kilometers down, where you have this gas coming up and forming mud volcanoes. The pressures are about the same, about the same. Maybe a bit, maybe a bit higher. And before we open up the, you know, the questions, so what, what, what is your opinion then as to the reason why there's such a visceral anti-fracking lobby in North America, and not just in North America, but in Europe in general? Like in the UK, for example, if you measure, you know, if, if you mention fracking to people, they go into... Paroxysms. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, for one thing, lack of familiarity. Number two, that's a big, big industrial activity, and it requires 150 truckloads or, or more, 250 truckloads, to bring everything onto site. So it's, it's a perturbation of, the, of their lifestyle. The population density in Europe is, you know, I mean, you remember that, you know, Europe can fit very comfortably into a corner of Canada, okay? A lot of the hydraulic fracturing that takes place in Canada takes place in remote areas where the population density is, well, in some areas, less than a person per square kilometer. You can't frack anywhere in Germany without looking around and seeing a thousand houses from the rig floor. Now, everybody wants cheap power. Everybody wants reliable power. And everybody wants power that does not cause any environmental impact. My comment is, choose two of the three. You won't get all three. The Germans are opting for paying higher energy rates, much higher, to give you an idea. In Germany, you pay 35 cents a kilowatt hour. Here in uh, Ontario, the highest prices in Canada, 11 cents a kilowatt hour. In Quebec, five and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Now, if the Germans are prepared to pay 35 cents a kilowatt hour to have a very high percentage of renewables, that is a policy decision. But by the way, the consumption of coal in Germany has been rising the last three years. Why? They just don't have the storage capacity for the renewable power, the solar and wind power that they're generating. They cannot store it and use it during periods when the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining. So they are up against the wall. And they've promised to shut down all the nuclear power plants. So guess what? They're burning more coal. It's an interesting decision that people don't want to burn clean natural gas because it might perturb their lifestyle, but they're quite prepared to increase the coal consumption. Those are policy decisions. I have really no comment on a policy decision. That's for the people to decide. And if that's what they decide, that's what they get. The Germans have voted in favor of renewable power. They pay four times as much as you. That's a decision they made. I'm sorry, I'm preaching. <laughs> no, it's a fact. I mean, if Ontario, if you say, look, let's get off of fossil fuels, I'll support you 100% and do my best to help with that, with new energy storage methods that, I'm, that I actually am working on. But you will have to pay a lot higher price, like Eric regularly in the Globe and Mail said. It's, so it's your, it's your choice. So we've done enough talking tonight. What about some questions from the audience? Yes. Those, all those trucks that were going along putting the uh, use for the fracking, what is that stuff? And it certainly doesn't occur naturally once you get it down there. Actually, it does. Every time you have a soft ice cream cone with, uh, in the summer, you're actually uh, consuming some fracture chemicals. I don't do that. Okay. In that, uh, if you look on uh, any, kind of a, uh, any kind of a jam or a jelly or a marmalade uh, that you might have with your toast in the morning, 
there is usually some xanthate gum or some guar gum. That's part of the fracturing uh, operation. The fractures are held open by propens. That's sand. So about 99.5% of the propping, uh, pardon me, of the hydraulic fracture fluid is water, gum, or, 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 or you know, uh, polymers, natural polymers, and sand. Then there's a very small percentage of uh, materials that some of them are, are, are dangerous. And the industry, under great pressure from people like you and me and the regulators, the industry is moving away from those chemicals to more benign chemicals under pressure, thank goodness. That means that if there's a truck accident, we don't have a spill of a really dangerous chemical, it's only a mildly dangerous chemical. So things are getting better, but it's under pressure from us. Don't relieve that pressure. It's our right to ask that this be done safely. But compared to, say, 10 years ago, the fracture jobs are 10 times larger, but they may be five times safer. But what about the structure underneath? When you disturb all that, wouldn't eventually... No, no. No, no, uh, we're, we're actually adding volume, so we're not, we're not taking away anything. Uh, we've been producing natural gas here in Ontario and oil in Ontario for uh, since uh, uh, 1858, and it doesn't create sinkholes and it doesn't create a dropping down. Uh, and let me, let me put this into scale. If this is the, uh, the, the, where you're fracking down here on the floor, and that's the surface of the earth, the fractures that you generate by fracking go up this high. Okay? So they've got two kilometers of shale and impermeable rocks between the fractures, the, the top of the fractures, and the surface of the earth. So the, they don't impact the surface of the earth. They really don't. Yeah. Now, do they cause micro-seismic events or small earthquakes? Yep. You bet they do. Is, are they huge earthquakes? Nope. But you might not like being in a position of feeling some small earthquakes either. If you don't want, if you don't want earthquakes, then ban hydraulic fracturing. That's your choice. That's a policy decision. But if you're going to have hydraulic fracturing, you're going to have some small earthquakes. Not shakers. It's not going to break your windows, but you will feel small vibrations. But then the vibrations that you feel from hydraulic fracturing might be no larger than the vibrations that you feel when an 18-wheeler goes by your apartment block on University Avenue. So you have a question on the left. If, if we take a look at the, um, the map where we showed all the seismic activity, natural seismic activity, and we overlay a map where you show all the um, fracking activity, there's, there's a lot of overlap on the west coast. I'm wondering, does it make sense to poke the bear sort of? Putting all the micro seismic where there's potential macro seismic mm -hmm. on the Pacific Coast? Well, um, there's been a lot of discussion as to whether or not uh, you know, human activity actually produces large earthquakes. And we're trying to, for example, and, and, and the, um, the, uh, the, the three coaches. But I think the sort of the sort of localized, the localized stress, sort of increase that we're talking about here with, with the actual industrial fracking process is so small compared to tectonic scale stress changes that you know, we can't really compare them. So I would be very, very skeptical of any linkage uh, between fracking activity, let's say, and the occurrence of natural earthquakes. The uh, the province of British Columbia, for example, is uh, prohibiting uh, hydraulic fracturing within so many hundreds of meters of an identifiable fault, just as a security uh, measure, okay? So that they have to stand off far enough from the fault so that the fluid pressure cannot interact with the fault. Uh, you can do those kind of things. That's part of the regulatory process. Uh, you monitor to try to understand what's going on. But you're going to have earthquakes if you do hydraulic fracturing, but they're going to be small because the volumes that we inject are small. These are trivial volumes compared to the natural 
hydraulic fracturing episodes that Dr. Uh, Evans was describing. Yeah. Are there any regulations prohibiting shallow fracturing? Yes. What is the minimum depth covering them? Well, it's... Right now in the Alberta Energy Regulator, uh, you cannot uh, do hydraulic fracturing any closer than 100 meters vertically. From uh, that, that's the top of the for formation. So your formation might be this thick. So from the top of this formation to the bottom of the groundwater uh, uh, level, and the groundwater level is defined as 4,000 parts per million so uh, sodium chloride. And as you know, that's not drinkable. But so that's 100 meters. Uh, I've recently written a recommendation for the Alberta government to increase that to 400 meters, just for more security. When you're doing shallow fracturing in Alberta, you can do it, but you can't use the liquids and the chemicals that people are concerned with. You can do shallow hydraulic fracturing with carbon dioxide or nitrogen. And those are non-toxic. So that the, if there is interaction with the potable groundwater with some nitrogen gas or uh, even methane, because did you know that 30% of the water wells in New Brunswick have methane in them naturally? Yeah? So you know, if you have some methane or some nitrogen or some carbon dioxide getting into, into, uh, into wells, it's not a good thing, but it's not a... It's not like chlorinated hydrocarbons which cause cancer. So yes, there are regulations. Yes, those regulations are evolving. Yesterday, uh, actually Friday, the uh, US uh, EPA had just issued its hydraulic fracturing regulations. You can download them from the web. And they're more severe than the regulations were 10 years ago. So yes, industry is on a relatively tight leash and much, much more so in Canada. We are much better regulated in Canada than the United States. Yeah. Part of the reason is because we do have naturally fractured rock in shale mm -hmm. and in shallow areas like southern Ontario, where we're undergoing glacial rebound, which opens up mm -hmm. the fractures, and we have a lot of horizontal fractures mm -hmm. that uh, cause groundwater problems uh, beyond the ones that our engineers protect. Mm -hmm. This is where I'm concerned about. Sure. Yeah, well, let, let, me, let me be blunt. Compared to the targets in Pennsylvania, the stuff you've got in South, southern Ontario is really crappy. Uh, you know? In, in Ontario. I'm not talking about East Coast or New Brunswick, or, uh, but the targets in Ontario are really crappy. Pardon? The Bowers River. Shale? Bay oh, the Hudson's Bay Lowlands. Okay, sure. Risk. Okay, the, the, the thickness of the, of the Hudson's Bay Lowlands sediments onshore, I believe, is a maximum of 600 meters. And you're not going to fracture 600 meters down. Uh, in the middle of the Hudson's Bay, uh, in the middle of the Akutan, ba uh, the Akutan Basin, it's 2.8 kilometers. So if you're going to do any natural gas development in the Hudson's Bay area, it has to be offshore. And you're not going to put any offshore platforms with the ice conditions in Hudson's Bay. It will not happen in the lifetime of your great-grandchildren or ever, in my view. It's just too challenging. So we're going to exploit stuff that is far, far easier, like BC, Alberta, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, maybe New Brunswick not the Hudson's Bay Lowlands. That's not going to happen in our, in our lifetimes. Or, you know, the odds are very, very remote. On the other hand, we're getting better at it. We're doing a lot better than we did 10 years ago. We, do, we now know more about monitoring and, and safety and better chemicals and all these kind of things, so that the environmental risks are dropping. Maybe not fast enough, but they continue to drop. And you can set the rules. You and other citizens help the regulator set the rules. We have time for two more questions. Mm -hmm. Number one. Okay. Um, the fracking, 
Is it just done when you're developing the wells, or is that something that has to continue? No, it's done when you develop the wells. And then you let the natural gas flow, so the pressure actually drops and drops and drops in the reservoir, so that you don't have a high pressure anymore that can go anywhere. In fact, the pressure is dropping. So that means that the, that the gas is not flowing out, it's flowing towards the wells. Okay, so you actually are reducing the risk of any gas from that formation getting into and getting anywhere else. It's only during the high pressure fracturing that there is a risk. Yeah. Time for one more question. There's water use, yep, a lot. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, uh, a very, very large fracturing draw. The biggest fracturing jobs in the entire world, which are being done in northeastern British Columbia, uh, use less water in, in, uh, in a huge fracturing job, which might take a week uh, for a well, than the city of Toronto does in uh, 12 hours. And that area is cut by the Liard River and is very moist. So water pressure on the, on the, on the uh, watershed there is, is unmeasurable. It's unmeasurable, literally. It's, it's, you, you can't measure the impact. Now that is different, for example, if you're in the middle of Australia. In the middle of Australia, there's the Amadeus Basin, where two, three kilometers deep, it looks like it's very prospective for shale gas. They're actually talking about the possibility of bringing in seawater, salt water, from a, with a pipeline, a 1,800 kilometer pipeline from the nearest ocean to use as fracturing fluids if the Amadeus Basin is ever developed. Okay. Same thing in New Brunswick. I mean, if people are, even though there's no, you have all the water you need, people get a bit antsy about using fresh water for fracking. So you can use salt water now. That's a new technical development in the last three or four years. So you can, if you want to, as a citizen with your regulatory agency, you can say, we want to prohibit the use of fresh water. You can, you can, that's a policy issue, not a technical issue. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, we appreciate your interest. Uh, and of course, uh, I'll stay here and answer any more questions on a personal basis if you want. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.